So here we are on this very first Sunday of 2017, and I want to think uh, briefly about uh, walking with God in this new year. So walking with God in 2017. It is a new year, so have any of you set resolutions? No, not one. Or is it just that you're thinking, oh, if I say I have, you'll ask me what it is. Because <laughs> that was the next question. So none of you have set resolutions. I find that hard to believe. However, however, some people do set resolutions at New Year, because it's the time that people reflect uh, on what has been and what's coming and what kind of changes uh, that they might make in their lives. So I was reading a bit online, because there's loads of stuff online uh, about people having made resolutions and, and sort of things that they've said and done. And one person wrote, I can't believe that it's a whole year since I didn't become a better person. <laughs> Another person wrote, uh, I'm going to work out every day. At least I'm going to think about it every day. I, uh, my resolution for 2017 is to accomplish all the goals that I set in 2016, which I should have done in 2015 because I actually planned them in 2014. As I was uh, preparing for this, uh, I read an article in a psychology journal. It's not a thing I normally do, I have to say, uh, but it was talking about reasons why people make resolutions and, and some why they don't make resolutions. And for lots of people, one of the reasons that they don't make resolutions is that they're frightened. They're frightened of not being able to carry it through. So, today I want to look at the life of Moses and how important it is to get started. Because we need to start. We might need to be on one, I think. I'm not sure. I can't remember. Oh, there we go. Aye, and maybe another one just in a wee minute. So, we're going to get started. We're looking at Moses to get started. And I have to say, this is a regardless of age thing. Sometimes we think changing and starting is only for the young. Well, I don't think so. Maybe this is the year for you to get fit and healthy or maybe this is the year for you to restore a relationship or to be more generous with your time or money. Maybe this is the year for you to stop being so dependent on technology or to stop being so uh, beholden to your diary and all the things that take up your time and, and to give yourself to other people. In order to help us think a little bit about it, though, what I want to do is forget all of that just for a moment and go to the end of your life. In fact, just beyond it. And you're looking back at all of the folk who are eating their little sandwiches and sausage rolls in whichever hotel your family have chosen to commemorate you. Right? <laughs> and you might be surprised by how little they're willing to spend. Um, however, let's not go there. <laughs> But, but there you are, uh, you're, you're looking on to this, and the question is, what do you hope they're saying about you? What kind of person have you been? What are these folk, some of whom know you very well, others who might not know you terribly well, but what is it that you hope that they are going to be saying about you? Because in that answer to that question, you might just find out where you need to start in 2017. You see, if you want them to say what a kind person you were, you need to be kind. If you want them to say what a compassionate and generous person you were, you need to be compassionate and generous. If you want them to say what a godly person you were, you need to spend time with God. So what happens at the end actually is determined by what happens now. So, that's kind of what we're going to do with Moses. I want to look at his life. Moses, um, we're told in Hebrews eleven twenty four to 26, it says, By faith Moses, when he'd grown up, he refused to be known as the son of Pharaoh's daughter. He chose to be ill-treated along with the people of God rather than to enjoy the fleeting pleasures of sin. He regarded disgrace for the sake of Christ as of greater value than the treasures of Egypt because he was looking ahead to his reward. What an amazing thing uh, to be said about somebody. 
And what a great thing it would be if it was said about you or me. But you see, that's where Moses ended. That's not where Moses began. We look at these folks and we see in that list that we read through, all of these names of folk in the Bible, and they're considered to be heroes of the faith. But they didn't start off as heroes of the faith. Moses started off, just in case you're, you're, you're not really uh, too sure of his story, he was born to a slave. He was a Hebrew, uh, and his uh, parents were Hebrews, and they were in slavery in Egypt. And he was born at a time when uh, the population of the uh, Hebrews was growing, and it was beginning to threaten the Egyptians. And so what Pharaoh decided was that uh, all of the male children who were born had to be killed by being thrown into the River Nile. But his parents, uh, as we read, they didn't do what Pharaoh said, uh, and he was put in a, in a wee basket uh, that would float, and he was put into the river. And, and he was found by Pharaoh's daughter, and Pharaoh's daughter took this Hebrew baby as her own, and he was educated, um, and he lived with Pharaoh's family. And he had the best of uh, that privileged position. But he never forgot that he wasn't Egyptian, that he was actually a Hebrew. And one day he saw an Egyptian man um, ill-treating a Hebrew, and so he took uh, steps himself to do something about it. He killed that Egyptian, and he had to flee. And he ended up out in uh, the wilderness, in the desert, where he became a shepherd. And he was there for 40 years. During that time uh, in the wilderness, he had a child or his wife had a child, um, and they called him Gershom. And that means I'm a foreigner in a foreign land. Moses' whole life was one where he didn't quite fit. And then one day out in the wilderness, he met God. And he saw a bush that appeared to be on fire, but it wasn't being consumed. It wasn't being burnt. And as he went over to see what it was that was happening, because that was quite unusual, God spoke to him from this burning bush. And he has that experience to, to think about in the years that will come to him. However, God says to him something that I suspect he didn't want to hear. Because he says, Moses, I want you to go back to Egypt and I want you to go back to Pharaoh, I'm a different Pharaoh by this time, but go back and I want you to say, you have to let the Israelites go. Well, the Israelite was the whole slave labor for the Egyptians. I mean, this is a huge thing. Understandably, Moses isn't that keen, but this is essentially where his ending starts. Everything up until now has been training for this moment and for what will come after this moment. So what do we find out about Moses and how he responds to it? Well, the first thing is this, that you start where you are. You start where you are. Moses, as he thinks back on this man that he killed, and that mistake plays on his mind, and he knows that if he goes back, he's likely to get into to trouble. So he says to God that he can't possibly lead uh, the people because of his past, uh, and he's just not at all suitable to lead these people and to do what God said to him to do. God says something to Moses that I think he still says to his people today, I will be with you. I will be with you. I think lots of people discount what God could do through them because they think about their past and the mistakes that they've made and the issues that are there. And they forget that God says, the future is to be different. And when you walk into it, I will be with you. It doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter what you've done. It doesn't matter what you've lost, and it doesn't matter how good the past has been. God says to you today, I am with you, and we are going to do things that will bring me glory. I once heard a preacher put it this way, if you're not dead, you're not done. I just want to repeat that. If you're not dead, you're not done. You have a place in God's plan, regardless of your age and your experience. The future can be different, 
and should be different to the past. It doesn't matter what age you are. God has something to do in you and through you, and we all start where we are. The second thing is this. Use what you have. Despite God's promise of his presence, Moses still argues that he's definitely not the right person to send to do this job. He asks what will happen if they don't believe him or if they don't listen. And as he is speaking, God asks him a question. What's in your hand? And Moses says, it's my staff. It's easy to read that and kind of just gloss over it. Moses had a staff because he was a shepherd. He didn't have a staff because there was anything special about the staff. He didn't have a staff because he had brought it to give to God. There was nothing about the staff other than he had it because he was a shepherd. That's what he knew. That's what he understood. That's what he brought and what he had in his hand. And when he recognized that, God used that staff to perform miracle after miracle at God's direction. Moses did amazing things because he took the staff that he'd had in his hand and God used it. What's in your hand? You might say, as people frequently say to me, oh no, no, I'm not really good at anything. No, I, I, no, no, I couldn't do that. No. Some of you are going, Ooh, I did that. <laughs> But, that, but, but we do. But nobody likes to put themselves forward. Nobody likes to say, I'm really good at something. And we tend to, to, to do the opposite. And we say, oh, no, I don't, I don't have any talents or skills, nothing that really could be uh, of any great use to God. Can you make soup? Can you knit a scarf? Can you make tea and coffee? Can you use a computer? Have you experienced dealing with money? Now, you might think these are just tiny, insignificant things, but actually when you give them to God, they can have a huge impact. A plate of soup can be a huge blessing to a family that are struggling. A scarf to give to somebody who's cold, helping somebody to plan a budget when they're struggling with their money. These are all good, positive things that seem simple. And we would say, oh no, I, I don't really have any skills. And yet there we are. And I know there's loads of people with other skills that they can bring to God. The thing that seems to us to be really ordinary when given to God can become extraordinary. That neighbor who would never consider crossing the door of the church might be open to listen to the gospel over a cup of coffee and a scone. What's in your hand? You use what you have because what you have is exactly what God uses. You've got to start where you are. It doesn't matter where you are when you know who you're with. When God says, I will be with you, the creator of the universe says, I will be with you. It's an amazing thing. Just use what you have because what you have is what God chooses to use. So you start where you are, you use what you have, and the third thing is this, that you do what you can. Moses comes back again to God and says, oh no, not me, because well, I'm not very eloquent. I'm, I'm really, I'm pretty rubbish at the speaking thing, uh, so no, it, it can't possibly be me. So God tells him to remember who gave people their voices in the first place. And he says that he'll help Moses speak and he'll also teach him what to say as he goes. As he goes. I don't know if it's uh, just me, but do you feel like we've got tension in this conversation? God's kind of like, Moses, really? Will you just go? Will you just get started? It's like when you have children and you're trying to put them to bed. And they can be absolutely exhausted. And as soon as you mention bed, it's like you've given them espresso. And it's bing, and they're wide awake. And, oh, no, I don't want to go to bed. No, I'm not tired. Me tired? No, I'm not tired. And you go, oh, the, can you read me a story? I can't find my teddy bear. Where's my blanket? I'm scared in the dark. Oh, I need a drink of water. I need a pee-pee. You go, oh, because they don't want to go to bed. 
And it's kind of like, that's, that's what it is here with Moses. He's finding all these ridiculous excuses for not doing what God says. And I sense a wee bit of that kind of there with God. He says, Moses, will you just go and get on with it? I think for some of us in 2017, God's going to put his foot to our backsides and tell us to get on with it. Today is the day to get started. When better than the first day of the year? We have to start where we are, wherever that is. Whatever we've done, whatever uh, has been in our past, we start where we are. And it doesn't matter where we are because we know the one who is with us, the creator of the universe. He wants to do something through you and in you that will be extraordinary. So give him what you have, the things that are ordinary, the things that you think or have thought in the past are too simple or too little, that are not worth it. Give them to him and watch him do amazing things with them. Just get started. God says that he'll teach you what to say and what to do. None of us know the future. None of us have all the answers. None of us have everything sorted to the extent where we feel capable and comfortable of doing those things that God has called us to do. That's not how it works. God doesn't give us everything in advance so that we are feel equipped to step into what he's calling us to. He says, I'll teach you as you go and I'll be with you. And there may be people here today and you're thinking that you need to be more uh, educated or biblically literate before going and doing what God's called you to. But the truth is, most of us are educated and biblically literate far beyond our level of obedience. We simply need to get going using what we have. Can you heal that broken relationship today? Well, probably not. But you can apologize for your part in it. Can you get out of debt today? Well, probably not, but you could plan a budget and arrange a first payment. You see, sometimes what happens is we look down the road and we think God is taking us in a particular direction and we don't like it. We look at the steps ahead uh, as we see them and we decide that step 28 is far too hard. So we're far better just staying where we are and not really doing anything uh, after all. But God is saying that you need to get moving because what you don't know is that you're never going to get to step 28 because that's not the direction he's going to take you in anyway. And you'll find that as you walk in step with God, you just start where you are and you take one step at a time. You use what you have and you do what you can. God takes us on this journey that you have planned in your head and you discover it's not his plan and his plan is better. God wants to take the ordinary things that we have and turn them into something extraordinary. So when you get worried about step 28, well, actually, don't worry about step 28. Take one step at a time. And as you walk, God will walk with you. He will teach you. He will help you to know what to do and what to say and where to go. But you just have to get started. You be you and let God be God. Start where you are. Use what you have do what you can. A reading mentions some well-known characters from the Bible, and along with some uh, who are not even named, we don't know anything very much about them. But what it reminds us also is that their weakness was turned into strength. Their weakness was turned into strength. You can look at your situation and what you think God may be calling you to, and you can become overwhelmed. Mother Teresa said this, if you can't feed a hundred people, just feed one. In other words, just get started. Do something. Acknowledging your weakness and trusting in God allows him to make you strong. Start where you are. Use what you have. Do what you can. Because you can never finish something that you don't start. When we read on in the story of Moses, we see how God fulfilled his promises to Moses. God takes this man and does an incredible thing through him. In Hebrews 11, 26 and 27, it says this, He regarded disgrace for the sake of Christ as of greater value than the treasures of Egypt because he was looking ahead to what was to come to his reward. 
And then by faith he left Egypt, not fearing the king's anger. He persevered because he saw him who is invisible. He persevered because he saw God. Yes, he had a life-changing experience at the burning bush. But that wouldn't have carried him very far into the future when things began to get really hard. Moses needed a deeper and more intimate relationship with God, but it was one that he had to develop. He had to work at it. And during their journey from, e uh, from Egypt, Moses sent up what was called the tent of meeting, and he went in and out to spend time there with God. And in Exodus 33, 11, it says, the Lord would speak to Moses face to face as one speaks with a friend. He developed that intimacy with God. Now, we might not see God in a burning bush, but we can see him in his word, and we can experience his presence in prayer and in worship. And like Moses, our relationship with God is something that we need to continually develop. What if when people were sitting around eating their sandwiches and little sausage rolls, talking about you after your memorial service, what if they said about you, by faith, when they grew up, they refused to simply be a product of their environment. This was someone who pursued God for all they were worth. When they walked into the room, it was as if God himself had arrived. This was someone who was willing to give God all they had, and look at the result. This was someone who put their faith into action because they were looking ahead to the reward, and they knew God. We've got one shot at 2017. In fact, we've got one shot at life. We're never going to finish something that we don't start. So it's time to get started on that new thing with God. When we do and when we persevere, we'll find that we leave a legacy beyond our imagining. Amen.